Hey, it's the Comics Kid 2099. I'm that guy who's been wearing the same shirt for the last three videos. This is the last one for today. As you can see, I'm trying something different. I'm filming outside. I may not like how it sounds with all the sounds of nature interrupting the video, but we'll see. I just wanted to, did you hear that? It sounded like a gunshot. So we'll just see what happens. I want to talk to you about a graphic novel, Zombie Reanimated by James Farr and, and Nate Lovett. They are really going to town shooting over there. Zombie Reanimated was, maybe if I wait till they're done, okay. Zombie Reanimated was a series of web cartoons created by Farr and at one point he wanted it to be a live action film. I had never actually heard of this until I saw it at the comic book shop and it was very reasonably priced and I thought, you know what, this looks very interesting, the art looks great. Uh, as I've said before, I really like the more animated style of artwork and this is definitely that. Uh, this looks like it could be a cartoon and since it's based on a web cartoon about these characters set in this world, it makes sense that it looks very animated, and I'm very okay with that. I'm not actually a fan of zombies, and I think one reason is usually all zombie stories are the same story. I can't think of a single zombie story that doesn't follow the same formula, where the apocalypse happens and then you get about five people together, and then you follow their interactions, usually some of them die, some of them persevere in this new climate that they live in, and by the end of the story, it's maybe been a week or two since the apocalypse started. Almost every zombie story follows that pattern. You have parodies like Shaun of the Dead, you have The Walking Dead comic books, you have The Walking Dead TV show, you have all the Romero films which started this formula, then you have post-Romero movies which follow a more scientific way of doing it, like the 28 days later, 28 weeks later. The only time I can think of where that formula was not strictly followed was the Marvel Zombies stories. And in my opinion, those weren't any better than a story that follows the typical formula because I don't care about the characters of zombies. I care about the survivors who are fighting the zombies. So I didn't even bother reading those. This, however, breaks formula and does it in a very interesting way. This story takes place about 30 years after the zombie apocalypse has already happened. I don't think I've ever seen a story even try to do that, and automatically it's trying to do something different from a genre that I don't really care for, and that was really something that intrigued me when I started reading this. The story is about a group of humans, I think they're the last of humanity, they live in this fairly large fortress that's surrounded by a force field, and I think every week or every day, it's something like that, I think it's every week, a group of humans from the fortress, they leave the fortress to go get a power source that powers the force field. There are some logistic problems that I have with this book. None of them are so big that I can't enjoy the story, but I do wish some of these things were explained a little more. For example, one of the soldiers even says they can only carry one power source at a time when they go out to get the power source for this force field. And I don't even know what the power source is. I don't know why it's so heavy. See, they're going on a magnetic train that goes really fast, and I'm not sure why they couldn't just find two of them. Wherever it is they go, it's never explained why they can't manufacture this power source inside the fortress. There are a few scientists who live there at the fortress, so there's no reason why they wouldn't be able to just figure this out and build it there. And there's no real reason they explain why this power source is exists. It exists in a way where they can only take one at a time. These things are happening so that the story itself can happen because the story starts when this group of soldiers, they are attacked when they're trying to get the power source and the power source doesn't make it back to the fortress. So now the last of humanity, their power, their force field thing is gonna die down because they don't have a power source to keep it going. So I get that any story has to happen when there's a break in the status quo or 
any story has to happen when there's a break in the status quo, which is how things have been before the story starts. So that's what happens here. Before this story starts, humanity lives in this fortress with the power, with the power shield thing. And then the status quo is broken when a group of soldiers aren't able to make it back with the power source. The problem is, it doesn't make any kind of sense. I'm poking all kinds of holes in this very small premise, and I just wish they had taken less than a page to explain why this power source can't be manufactured in the fortress, or why they can only take back more than one. There are some other things in the story that don't make a lot of sense. For example, if it's been 30 years since the zombie apocalypse started, then where are all the zombies who are living in the world getting their human flesh? Because it seems to me that all of humanity lives in this fairly large city that's protected by a force field. And if the zombies aren't eating humans outside of the force field, they still exist 30 years later. We see plenty of them active outside of the force field, but we're not told where they're getting their sustenance, and it makes me wonder if the zombies even have to eat human flesh at all. And if they don't, then why do they eat human flesh if they don't need it to survive? This is something that's not really explained, and again, it's this is not something that is such a problem that I can't enjoy the story. I actually really enjoyed this book. I just wish that these logistical problems with the plot have been explained a little bit so that I could have enjoyed it even more. The only other thing in this book that's not really explained to my liking is that there are two zombies in the story who are intelligent and can think and communicate with humans. Every other zombie in this story is a typical Romero-esque zombie in that they just eat brains, they lumber, and they aren't really intelligent at all. Now, it's never explained why these two zombies in particular retain their intelligence, although in the case of both of them, it seems like they don't remember their, live, their lives as humans. They only remember that they were humans and they're able to communicate and function. But it's like up to a certain point, they don't remember anything before that. I just wish they had done something a little similar to, say, Angel from Buffy the Vampire Slayer. That show made a point of explaining that every vampire is very evil to their core and that they don't have a soul. And then they give us Angel, who's the exception to the rule. But instead of just saying, here's a guy who's different than all the other vampires, deal with it, they actually explain how he has a soul and then we're good. It doesn't take that long to explain and then once they do explain it, we can move on and tell stories about this character. And I wish they had done something like that with the two zombies here. It shouldn't have taken very long at all to explain why they are able to talk and communicate with humans, and I feel like it could have made this story almost perfect if they had just taken care of these little plot problems that aren't really explained. As I said, the story begins when a group of humans who are sent to go get the power source for this force field don't return. Somehow, the humans who are in the fortress find out that the humans who were sent out of the fortress were attacked by an intelligent zombie. And uh, it's a zombie with a shotgun, so clearly he's intelligent. So there's a girl who lives in the fortress. She's a teenager. We're not really sure how old she is. And when she was an infant, somehow she was lost outside of the fortress and was presumed dead. And somehow she was old enough to remember that it was an intelligent zombie who saved her and brought her back to the fortress. Uh, some point in the story, they mentioned that she was several hundred miles away from the fortress, and that's why the people in the fortress didn't bother going out to look for her. And it's really this very reason that it seems like it's not that ridiculous that someone rescued her and brought her to the fortress. If you're an infant, you're not going to be able to travel hundreds of miles and find the place you're supposed to be. It's not really explained how this human girl, her name is Zoe, it's not really explained how she remembers that it was a zombie who saved her. So the humans talk to Zoe and they say, we need you to come with us and make sure that it wasn't the zombie who rescued you who attacked the train when it was bringing back the power source. Now Zoe is understandably very angry about this because she spent her entire life telling the humans in the fortress that a zombie rescued her when she was a baby and nobody has ever believed her. It's even implied at one point that they try to use shock treatments or something because they think that she's mentally damaged 
when she tells people that there's an intelligent zombie who rescued her. And I'm not really crazy about the way the humans deal with her. Zoe's arc in this story is that she's tired of living in the fortress, and it's understandable that that's the case. Everyone in the fortress thinks that she's insane. It seems like they've even abused her, trying to get her to confess that it wasn't really a zombie who rescued her. And honestly, I don't think anyone would want to live under those conditions in such crapitude. Yeah, it's really strange that the humans are so brutal with her in trying to change her mind about what it was that rescued her when she was a baby and understandably she's really angry whenever they come to her and say hey we're gonna need you to see if that uh, zombie who rescued you is the one who attacked the train as it turns out it's not the one who rescued her and when they bring her out of the fortress and find the zombie who did rescue her uh, she stays behind somehow when the humans go back to the fortress they've convinced this intelligent zombie who saved Zoe his name is Dirge They've convinced him to go and get the power source and bring it back to the fortress. And somehow, Zoe has gotten away from them and is traveling with Dirge. This is a little bit ridiculous. In theory, these soldiers, they look extremely incompetent when they can't even keep up with a teenage girl for three minutes. But I'm okay with it because otherwise the story wouldn't be able to happen if we applied even a little bit of logic to this situation. So we have two protagonists, Zoe, who is tired of life and wants to die so that she can escape it all. And then you have Dirge, who is an intelligent zombie. He's kind of grumpy, but basically he's got a heart of gold and he is, he wants to protect humanity, but he wants to stay away from humanity. And over the course of the story, both of these people find out that they're kind of wrong in what they think. Zoe finds a new appreciation for life when she almost dies, and Dirge, he realizes that maybe he doesn't need to be isolating himself from these people that he's trying to protect for the last 30 years. Uh, I like Dirge's arc much more than I like Zoe's arc. I really found her sudden shift from I wish I was dead to yay I'm alive and I always want to be really drastic. And the only thing I can think of is that she's the kind of character who would maybe act this way, be very drastic, very dramatic. If I knew Zoe in real life, I probably wouldn't like her at all. I can kind of forgive that because I do find this story to be very enjoyable. I want to make sure that you understand I may be complaining about some things here, but it's only because I really enjoyed this book and I feel like it could have been a great book if just these few things have been changed or altered in some way. Dirge's arc, meanwhile, I find it to be much more easy to swallow and it's quite a bit better how it flows from beginning to end. One thing I really enjoyed about this book was the chemistry between Zoe and Dirge. I really felt like their banter was very natural and that couldn't have been very hard to pull off at all. Uh, if you try too hard the banter might feel biting or more realistically since it's been 10 or 15 years since Dirge even rescued Zoe chances are he wouldn't have anything to say to her because well in theory she probably shouldn't even remember who he is but i really did like the way they interacted i thought that was very nice and i that couldn't have been easy to do at all so kudos to you mr farr for pulling that off at the end of the book james farr wrote in the afterword that he wanted to write a story about what do the dead live for and of course the best way to do that would be in a zombie story that's actually a really interesting theme to me and I feel like this book you look at it you might be thinking okay that's a very lowbrow book it's a comic book which people typically don't even give props to anyway and it's about zombies no less but it really has an interesting theme that he spells out at the afterward and I think it works very well uh, you have your two intelligent zombies one of them he doesn't get a name he's the bad guy who stops the train from making it back to the fortress after all the complaints I've had about this book, I really like the bad guy and I like his motivation. You would think the bad guy is just doing what he does just because he's evil, but really he's acting out of self-preservation. Somehow he found a holographic display of a scientist who explained that they might be able to find a way to eradicate all of the zombies. He doesn't want that to happen. He doesn't want to go back to being dead. So that's why he's trying to prevent the humans from keeping their force field up. And then all of the zombies will come from around the world and attack the humans who are left. And then he'll be able to continue living. 
I really like that he's acting out of preservation. There's no malice in what he's doing. He's just doing what he feels like he has to do to survive. Dirge, on the other hand, he's risked his life several times to save Zoe, to save all of these humans who didn't even treat him that well when they sent him on this mission. And basically, he's just, he's willing to die to save others. I feel like we as the audience probably have more in common with the bad zombie who's acting out of self-preservation and will do wrong to others in order to help ourselves than we do with Dirge, who is the closest thing to a superhero that this book has to offer. And I really feel like that's an interesting way to look at these characters. Dirge is the aspirational figure that we should be more like, while this bad zombie is the character who we are all too much like, and we should strive to be less like just in being better human beings. At one point we find out that Dirge is actually Zoe's father and he is also the scientist who was in the holographic message who said that he would be able to find a way to eradicate all the zombies. I didn't really care for either of these developments at all. I think it's extremely hokey that out of all the zombies in the world somehow Dirge just happens to be Zoe's father. Uh, neither of them are actually aware of this by the end of the story. It's something only the audience is aware of. I just feel like the story isn't served in any way by this revelation, and it could have easily been taken out and the story would have been just as good. Likewise, I just didn't really care for the idea that Dirge was the scientist. I think the scientist could have been anybody who just happened to die before he found a way to succeed in his plans. Other than that, I think this book is really amazing. I I really tried not to spoil it too much. I know I did a little bit because this is a review, but if you see this book, I would recommend you go and get it. I would recommend you read it because I feel like it's worth your time and money, and I wish to see more from this team in the future, hopefully. So anyway, that's all I have to say. Uh, let me know what you thought about me filming outside. I really don't think I'm going to do this again or if I do I'm gonna to have to do it at a different time of the day I've had to shift my camera like six times because the Sun keeps moving and getting in my eyes uh, all these noises are really distracting for me you'll probably find it very hard to hear me over some of these noises so just let me know what you think and until then I'll see you next time